yeah, I mean, fuck it. Put this off long enough, it's time to just make a damn video. We all sold our souls in the 80s, or so I'm told. Um, I was like four, so, you know, I certainly wasn't signing any paperwork, I don't know. Uh, well, the rest of these people are too. Uh, but the reason that people say things like that is that something dramatically changed in the way that Western civilization handled its affairs. Shortly after 1979, the rise of neoliberalism. Neoliberalism has become a buzzword on the left. We hear it all the time. We use it constantly to describe things that have been happening in the United States, Western civilization, and that have been perpetrated upon other nations for many years now. But defining it is very difficult. However, its use can be very flexible, its appearances can be very different, and its utilization can be very complicated. I am Aaron Lampe, sociologist and philosopher. The project of this series of video essays is the definition of neoliberalism. This is, this is my life, this is what I do now. Mm. For my work, I tend to rely on the definition given by David Harvey in the introduction of A Brief History of Neoliberalism. Neoliberalism is a theory which claims that human well-being can best be advanced by liberating individual entrepreneurial freedoms and skills within an institutional framework characterized by strong private property rights, free markets, and free trade, that the role of the state is to create and preserve an institutional framework appropriate to such practices. It must also set up those military, defense, police, and legal structures and functions required to secure private property rights and to guarantee, by force if need be, the proper functioning of markets. Furthermore, if markets do not exist, then they must be created by state action if necessary. But beyond these tasks, the state should not venture. State interventions in markets must be kept to a bare minimum. Basically, it posits that what's best for people is what's best for markets. That all of ethics can be boiled down to economic relations. That what is good for people is what is good for making money. Neoliberalism is, in the first instance, a set of economic, political theories, then a globally and locally hegemonic ideology. Sets of theories were applied a long time ago in various fields in order to replace problematic theories or in order to induce wealth for certain individuals. And this happened somewhat simultaneously all around the world, opposing an old system of economics. And when that happened, the whole world started to change very quickly. And because all of the people who were a part of this in positions of power had so much to gain from it, a lot of the media and the ideologies that people were exposed to on a global level, and this is an extremely globalist thing, it's part of the rise of the globalist cultures, it's left people with very few alternative modes of thought. Most of us have been raised in this. I mean, there were people who thought very differently before 1980, who started to think in almost purely ne neoliberal terms when it came to things like finding employment and the purpose of education, the uh, fate of the commons, etc. It leads to the fact that governments cannot help their people. Instead, they must facilitate market in order to provide services for them. Those service providers need to be able to get wealthy rather than individuals paying taxes in order to have common goods established. Austerity and tax cuts must be made in order for people to make personal choices to help themselves. But those who are in a position to make financial choices often have considerably more to gain while those who are left with fewer choices because of desperation, because they don't have that kind of money, those people wind up suffering. They also wind up being hostages to the market system, which has replaced social catch nets. Governments are forced to deregulate industry and are not allowed to interfere with corporations, while simultaneously it must protect the interests of corporations from the citizenry. This is an anti-democratic idea. Wendy Brown argues that neoliberalism can be categorized why would I do this? I'm going to do this during the think. Neoliberalism can be characterized as a political rationality, which has undermined democratic forms of participation by casting the market as the model for the entire society. It's important to recognize that there are many dimensions to neoliberalism. We can certainly look at it as a set of policies or as an ideology. 
but the notion of political rationality reveals the extent to which we are governed by forms of reason, and not only by policy, material forces, or by belief. Rather, it is normalized. It has brought new kinds of subjects, new forms of subjectivity, and new social relations into being. Under neoliberalism, we understand ourselves through and orient our actions around certain values. These values not only inform who we are and what we are worth, they also determine what we can expect from political orders, and indeed what we think politics and democracy are and are for. The concept of political rationality identifies these ways of being governed normatively, which are as important as specific policies that favor capital, undermine organized labor, impede states from provisioning the basic needs of populations, or erode national sovereignty. After the Depression and between the World Wars, John Maynard Keynes rose as a global potentate in economics. His theories generally referred to as Keynesian or Keynesian economics, dominated Western civilization. They offered social catch nets in order to allow for the socialization of civilization in such a way as to prevent socialist uprising. It was designed to prevent fallout from particularly bad recessions like the Great Depression had been. After the U.S. hegemony rose after the end of the Second World War, socialism was established in the United States under Franklin Delano Roosevelt, particularly in the form of social security. The wealth culture was basically attacked. They lost a great deal of their political power and a lot of their influence over the public. Their response was the beginning of a series of culture wars, which over the course of the following decades would destabilize the pro-Kinsian worldview and leave people in a position where it would be easier for the egg of neoliberalism to hatch into the modern economic system. In the 1960s, Milton Friedman started up a group of fringe economists, which would later be referred to as the Chicago Boys. The Chicago Boys would then go on to become the economic advisors for powers all over the world, and in order to influence those powers, representing this fringe economic ideology of neoliberalism. An example of this was Milton's involvement in the rise of Pinochet. Milton Friedman approved of the dictatorship and chose not to criticize its assassinations, illegal imprisonments, torture, exile, or other atrocities all extensively chronicled by Amnesty International, now being carried out in the name of the free market. And this is something that you'll see a lot when you're studying neoliberalism, is how suddenly destroying economies and even national systems themselves for the betterment of a handful of very wealthy people who will be able to invest in them, force the markets open, and then have their foot in the door when those markets become. These people walk away with um, all of the money in an entire nation and leave uh, bankrupt dissidents behind to collapse in on their own weight. Some of these cases, it's through acts of unspeakable violence that have unmade regimes. Chile, Iraq, Afghanistan, just to name a few. Throughout the late 70s and early 80s, the era of the rise of neoliberalism could be seen to take place under the leadership of Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, Deng Xiaoping. And this involved what would later be referred to as the neoliberal turn when Keynesianism was replaced with neoliberalism. Ronald Reagan rose to power largely by attacking higher education, particularly the University of California. In a private war with UCLA, he first rose to governorship. I have to make a note that I said that so that I can look it up later. Because it's not on my work side of page right now, it's going to need to be, now that I've said this. Margaret Thatcher's rise to power, involving a particularly large cohort of people then coming of age, looking at a system where very few survivors of the Second World War were pensioners, etc. There didn't seem to be a sense of social solidarity. So the social systems around um, that time were deconstructed. That ease of deconstruction started a downhill slide with the privatization of public housing and a series of austerity measures that would become the standard for her party from that point forward. Deng Xiaoping liberalized what had been the communist regime in China, allowing certain market structuralizations to take place so that they could become one of the major Asian powers and an economic powerhouse, having seen the successes in South Korea, Japan, and other parts of the region as they started to stabilize after the wars. This eventually involved the neoliberal turn. By the time the 1990s had come around, most economic policy had started to de-establish the notion of standards in public goods and controls of money supplies 
and the value of employment with an increase in the prospect of wealth creation and a decrease or at least minimization of inflation at all but any cost. This led to the phenomenon of accumulation by dispossession, in which the wealth culture would generate income not by finding ways of getting capital to build through production or the provision of goods and services, but by finding ways of charging the general public for things they already own, or in order to privatize commons so that things that people had common access to, like parking downtown, would have to be privatized in some way that someone somewhere could make some kind of money off of, who were able, because of the economic position that they were in, to make the investment in that in the first place. The results have been devastating for education, emergency housing, health care, environment, water, mail, etc. The very notion of a public good has been under attack and replaced with the notion of finding ways of generating wealth at any cost. Financialization took place with the creation of debt markets, subprime mortgage packaging, student debt, international credit and loan systems, which bankrupted whole nations, the finest example being Greece, and leaving people with no choice from nation to nation but to subsume themselves to the will of the rising powers within the newly established global marketplaces. This involved the World Trade Organization and the World Bank, two entities which have been used to maximize the efficiency of the impact of neoliberal ideology worldwide for the generation of wealth for a very small number of advantageous profiteers who now control the vast majority of the world's wealth. Asset and debt stripping became normal. Free speech became equivalent to money. International corporate fraud and speculation ran rampant. And inequality has been growing out of control to proportions that the United States has not seen since the Gilded Age. Neoliberalism has proven thus far to increase the effects of financial crises, to decrease economic stability, making those crises more likely and frequent, and has led to subsidization, taxation, and bailouts for the wealthy and the powerful, so that corporations are the only ones who have safety nets, while the safety nets are deconstructed in the rest of society in order to cause the poor to become more poor and the wealthy more wealthy. But even among libertarian ideology, there shouldn't be oil subsidies, which help lead to economic destruction and environmental destruction, which in a feedback loop does the same. These things take place in the courses of education, so that higher education becomes more and more expensive, while at the same time providing less and less actual education, and provides less and less experience and authenticity. Well, people need to spend longer and longer getting degrees, which are less and less valuable. Emergency housing, which was in many ways, by and large, done away with. Even here in Idaho, a lot of the emergency housing that was there when I first came of age is gone. Thatcher was notorious for selling off the public housing system to the private industry who made a killing on that deal and have been gentrifying it since, which helps lead to the housing crises that we're seeing internationally all across the world, and most particularly in Western developed nations and major cities, where the buying and selling of houses is now a neoliberal exercise in which people are trying to make money by generating higher levels of equity to buy, sell, and trade houses rather than finding a home to live in, as though People don't need to live anywhere because a human being's survival is not important. The marketplace is. You should be making as much money as you can. And making as much money as you can doesn't have anything to do with a roof over somebody's head. It has to do with how much money you can make selling a roof. Most people are paying for their homes through debt now. Virtually everyone. That's been normal for a long time. But college debt has reached unprecedented levels. Whole nations are wildly in debt. Debt systems were first developed in many of these places in order to give the government a way for neoliberals to take over in the first place. That's what happened in Chile. They first established a means of putting the Chilean government in debt to the neoliberals who were setting up the marketplaces and opening their capital to the international markets. People have normalized neoliberal ideologies' influences on them and reify it every day in the way that they communicate. We see it all the time. Tina is everybody's favorite example of this. Started with Margaret Thatcher. There is no alternative, meaning that the only way for a government to function 
involves needing to spend as little money as possible, so you have to cut all of the taxes and therefore cut all of the public funding for everything, while at the same time just not talking about the fact that you're selling what used to be public goods to the private sector so that people in positions of wealth have more and the people who are paying for it through taxes have less and less to show for it. The seeking of commodification rather than fulfillment is something that you can see in the way that people, for example, address higher education. They start talking in terms of how it's an investment in the self instead of how there might be any reason to learn something or to specialize within a particular field beyond how lucrative it is. Various forms of rational action theory where we presuppose that anything that goes on in the world is caused by individuals acting in a particular way rather than finding society condemnable or even observable. The framing of various terms or concepts within a market viewpoint, describing things in terms of exchange rather than human interaction, people attacking things as being free handouts, a rejection of the concept of the social good in general, people who look at problems like unemployment, medical problems, race, gender, general poverty, the housing crisis, or any number of other aspects as individuals who are lazy, who complain more than they should, or anything that shuts down the dialogue about society at large and individualizes everything, particularly when it individualizes it into a market framework. Hopefully between what I have here and what I plan to add later, I'll have done an adequate job of defining neoliberalism. Thank you for your time.